Today we are going to talk about ground. What ground is depends on who you're talking to at the time. To an electrician, ground is a solid connection to the earth, or a true earth ground. In fact, in Commonwealth countries they refer to this as earth. But to an electronics engineer, ground can be quite arbitrary. If you haven't already done so, you should view my video on measuring voltage which is linked above me. In fact, even if you have viewed that video, it wouldn't hurt for you to view it again. Let's take a quick review on how voltage is measured before we go into what ground is. I have on my board four 5 volt batteries placed end to end. Remember that voltage is a type of potential energy, and so is altitude, so we can use altitude as an example of how to examine voltage. So placing batteries end to end is like stacking buildings on top of each other. We can look at this as a 5 story building with another 5 story building on top of it giving us a total of 10 stories. Add another 5 stories and we have 15 stories. Another 5 stories we have 20 stories of potential energy from here to here. So with batteries we have 5 volts of potential energy. Add another 5 volts we have 10 volts. Another 5 volts we have 15 volts. And finally with 4 batteries we have 20 volts of potential energy from one end to the other. Now let's see what happens when we measure the voltages on this stack of batteries. I'm going to take my red pin and my black pin and I'm going to use these as analogs for the red and black probes of a voltmeter. Let's start by putting the black probe at the negative terminal of this 5 volt battery and the red probe at the positive terminal. So now the black probe is at the lower voltage, the red probe is at the higher voltage, and there's 5 volts in between them. So by design the meter is going to show us positive 5 volts. If I move the red probe here, now it will read positive 10 volts, positive 15 volts, now positive 20 volts. What's going to happen if I move the red probe here? Well remember, the voltmeter tells us the difference in voltage between the two probes. So if the two probes are at the same voltage, it will read 0 volts because there's no difference between the two probes. So if I have the black probe here and the red probe here, it will read 0 volts. So I have 0 volts, 5 volts, 10 volts, 15 volts, and 20 volts. Now let's see what happens if I put the black probe here. Now if I put the red probe here, once again, the red probe is 5 volts higher than the black probe, so the meter will tell us positive 5 volts. But if I move the red probe here, now the red probe is at a lower voltage than the black probe, and the difference is 5 volts, so now the meter will read negative 5 volts. So we will read negative 5 volts, 0 volts, positive 5 volts, positive 10 volts, positive 15 volts. If I move the black probe here, now we have negative 10 volts, negative 5 volts, 0 volts, positive 5 volts, positive 10 volts. If I move the black probe here, now we have negative 15 volts, negative 10 volts, negative 5 volts, 0 volts, positive 5 volts. And last but not least, we have negative 20 volts, negative 15 volts, negative 10 volts, negative 5 volts, and 0 volts. So this shows us that 0 volts is wherever I place the black lead of the voltmeter. Remember, 0 volts is not the absence of voltage. It is merely telling us that the black lead and the red lead are at the same voltage. So there's no difference between the two voltages and the meter reads 0 volts. In electronic circuits, it's very common to place the black lead of the meter at some point in the circuit and call that zero volts and reference all of the voltages measured with the red lead to that point. I avoid calling this ground in the lecture on measuring voltage because I was saving that term for this lecture. But we call that point in the circuit ground. There are two common places in electronic circuits to call ground. One would be the lowest possible voltage or the most negative voltage and in that case then all of our voltages measured with the red probe are going to be positive voltages no matter where we are in the circuit. The other logical place is going to be in the middle of the stack of batteries. This would be for circuits where it makes sense to have both positive and negative voltages. So I will have positive voltages here and negative voltages here and anywhere in the circuit I may have a positive or a negative voltage. So the first part of the definition of ground is that's the point in our circuit that we have designated as zero volts by placing the black probe there and measure all other voltages referenced to that point. The other part of the definition of ground is that ground must be able to absorb whatever current is necessary to operate the circuit without that voltage changing. Let's see what happens if we have a place that we think is ground but the voltage can change 
when the current changes through that point. I've just added a 1 ohm resistor to this circuit, and let's assume that this circuit is one where it makes sense to have both positive and negative voltages, so our ground is at this point right here. So this is now considered 0 volts. Let's assume that for now, there is no current flowing through this resistor. So what's the voltage going to be here? Well remember, for there to be a voltage difference, we must have resistance and current. So if there's no current flowing through here, there's no voltage difference. So if this is 0 volts, this is 0 volts. So if I put my probe here by mistake, let's see what happens. Now I have anchored my black probe at this point, but there's no current. It shows 0 volts. So when I measure my voltages with my red probe, everything should be normal. 0 volts, 0 volts, plus 5, plus 10, minus 5, minus 10. No problem. That seems to be working fine as a ground. But let's put some current through there and see what happens. Now I have one amp of current flowing into this resistor. What do I expect to happen to the voltage here? Well, I have conventional current flowing into the resistor and I expect the voltage to back up and become higher where that conventional current enters the resistor. So this voltage will go up. And so I have one amp going through one ohm, so this voltage should go up to positive one volt. Now let's see what happens if I measure my voltages. Well, if I have my black lead here, where it should be, the voltages will be no problem. Plus 5, minus 5, plus 1. But if I have my black lead here by mistake, what's going to happen to my voltages? I'm going to see what voltage here? I have the black lead and the red lead at the same place, so here I will see 0 volts. What will I see here? Well, I should see positive 5 here and 0 here. But now, my black lead is 1 volt too high. So I have 5 volts here and 1 volt here. There's only a 4 volt difference, so my meter is going to read positive 4 volts. And if I put my lead here, now I should see negative 5 and 0, but this is a volt too high. So I'm going to see negative 6 volts. So both of these voltages went down. So as my current increases, my voltage measurements will all go down. Now my current is flowing the opposite direction. So what's going to happen? Well, this voltage can't change because these batteries have such low resistance associated with them that I can take whatever current is necessary within reason and this voltage will not change. But we know that the voltage has to be higher where conventional current enters a resistor and lower where it exits. So what has to happen? This voltage must go down. So what's happened is that this voltage goes down to minus one volt. So now my black probe is at a volt too low. So when I measure this voltage, I should see positive 5, but now I have minus 1, positive 5, I'm going to see positive 6 volts here. And at this point, I should see negative 5 volts, but I've got negative 1, negative 5, only a 4 volt difference. Now I will see negative 4 volts. So when the current goes into this resistor, my voltages will all go up, and when current comes out of this resistor, my voltages will all go down. So this is not a suitable grounding point. I need to get my black lead over to my correct ground. And now, since my black lead is anchored at a place where my voltage will not change, and we've designated it as zero volts, even as my current increases and this voltage goes up and down, the other voltages in the circuit will not follow it. Now here I have a stack of four batteries supplying a circuit that expects both positive and negative voltages, and so I make my ground in the middle. What can I do if I have only one battery? So here I have a 20 volt battery, and if I want to measure my voltages, I don't have much choice in where I'm going to put my ground. I can put it at the negative side of the battery and measure positive 20 volts here, and in the circuit I can measure whatever voltages I have referenced to that ground. But what if I have a circuit that needs to have both positive and negative voltages? Let's see if I can pull a little trick with this. Now I have two 10 ohm resistors in a series circuit with my 20 volt battery. So how much voltage is going to be across each resistor? Well, they're equal resistance, so they must have equal voltage, and those two voltages must add up to 20, so therefore I must have 10 volts here and 10 volts here. Let's put my negative lead here and measure my voltages. I have 0 volts, positive 10, positive 20. What happens if I put my lead here? I have 0 volts, positive 10 volts, negative 10 volts. So can I use this as a ground for a circuit? Now I have 100 milliamps, or one-tenth of an amp, flowing into this circuit. So now with one milliamp going into this 
supposed ground, what's going to happen? Well, that current has to go somewhere, and it's going to go through this resistor back to the negative side of the battery. So we have 10 ohms and one tenth of an amp. What's going to happen is this voltage will rise by one volt. So now I have my negative lead here and my positive lead here. Since this voltage is now one volt higher than it was, I will only have nine volts here, but I will see minus 11 volts down here. So that's going to skew my readings again. So I cannot have any resistance between what I think is ground and my true ground. So this will not work as a ground. It'll, it'll start as a zero reference, but as soon as current starts flowing into it, that voltage will rise. And likewise, if we take current out of it, this voltage will go down. So when current goes in, voltage goes up. When current comes out, voltage goes down. So that will not make a suitable ground because this will not remain at the same voltage regardless of how much current is being absorbed or delivered by this point. Now that we've defined ground, what is different about a true earth ground? Well, a true earth ground is a safety feature when working with the power grid. Let's put a circuit here that we can use to represent the power grid. Here I have a 110 volt battery and a one ohm resistor representing the power grid. Now the power grid is alternating current and this is direct current, but for this demonstration, this will work the same and will be simpler to explain. The positive side of the battery represents the hot wire and the negative side of the battery represents the neutral wire. And down here I have the earth. When they set up the system, they design it so that the neutral wire has the same potential as ground and we measure all of our voltages in relation to the neutral wire. So this will be zero volts and this will also be zero volts and up here we'll have 110 volts. Now I've added a 5 ohm resistor here to represent a power tool or other piece of equipment hooked up to the power grid. Now let's put a little green man here to represent you or me using this power tool. So everything is well and good as long as we don't touch the hot wire up here. But if we touch the hot wire, what's going to happen? Now I'm connected to 110 volts here and zero volts here. So there's 110 volts across my body. That may not be particularly bad depending on the conditions. It takes approximately six milliamps directly through the heart to cause cardiac arrest. And to get that six milliamps, it takes anywhere from 50 to maybe 100 milliamps through the entire body. Now my body may have a resistance anywhere from 500 ohms to several hundred thousand ohms. So let's replace our little green man with a resistor and see how much current we're going to get under certain conditions. So here's that resistor and notice we have multiple current paths. So this resistor is in parallel with that resistor. Now let's put some resistance here and see what happens. So today is a dry day. I'm not particularly sweaty and I don't have a very good connection with the system. So my total resistance is about 300,000 ohms. That's in parallel with this five ohms. And we know that when we have two resistors in parallel, the total resistance will be something less than the lowest resistance. So this is such a high resistance that our total resistance is really about five ohms. And that's in series with one ohm powered by 110 volts. We do the math and that's going to put this at about 90 volts. That 90 volts across my 300,000 ohms is going to give me a total current of about three milliamps certainly not enough to cause cardiac arrest. I'm certainly going to feel it, but it's not going to be particularly dangerous. But let's say it is a humid day and I'm sweating and I do have a good connection, then my resistance will be more like, say about a thousand ohms. Now, all things being about the same, we're still going to have about five ohms here, about one ohm there. We're still going to have about 90 volts at this point. So 90 volts and a thousand ohms is going to give me 90 milliamps, certainly enough to be dangerous. So let's make this a little safer by putting a case around it so I can't accidentally touch that wire. So now there's a metal case around this protecting me from touching the wires. The wires are insulated from that case and now I'm safe. But what happens if there's a fault and while I'm using this, somehow this becomes connected to the case? Like that. Now I've got that 90 volts across my body again. I get my 90 milliamps and I get a trip to the hospital if I'm lucky. So. What are we going to do? What we'll do is we will, first of all, take this fault away and connect our case to the ground. And I'm representing the connection to the ground with a 0.001 ohm resistor. This is probably too high, but just for demonstration purposes and to get some meaningful numbers, let's put a little resistance here to see what happens. Well, right now, everything is okay because I'm touching the case, but the case is insulated, but the case is grounded. 
just in case. So let's see what happens when that fault reappears. So now my hot wire is connected to the case. I'm touching the case, so I've got that 90 volts across me again. Or do I? Let's make an equivalent circuit of what we have here and see what this ground does for us. So this is the equivalent circuit with the power grid here. Here's my power tool or other equipment. Here I am, and this is my ground wire. So remember that in a parallel circuit, our total resistance will be lower than our lowest resistance. So altogether, our total resistance will be about 0.001 ohms. Now we have 110 volts and 1.001 ohms. That's going to give us 110 amps. That sounds pretty beefy, but that's 110 amps going through only 0.001 ohms. So the total voltage we'll get here is going to be about a tenth of a volt. So these resistors are in parallel and they all only have about a tenth of a volt across them, putting about a tenth of a volt across me. And a tenth of a volt across a thousand ohms is only going to give me about a tenth of a milliamp of current. So this will certainly not be dangerous. So with this ground here, even if a fault does occur, I'm not going to get enough voltage across my body to deliver the necessary current to be dangerous. Now, this grounded case is not going to protect me if I go and touch the hot lead somehow myself, but the grounding of the case is there to protect me in case of a fault. While we're here, this is a good time to bust a popular myth about electricity. That myth is that electricity always takes the shortest path to ground. I've heard this myth from professional electricians, and it's a myth that can kill you. Here we have our power grid and our piece of equipment, but this time our ground is faulty and has 5 ohms of resistance. Let's draw the equivalent circuit and see what that does. So once again, here's the power grid, here's the piece of equipment, here's the faulty ground, and here's the little green man touching the equipment, represented by a 1000 ohm resistor. Now, these two 5 ohm resistors in parallel will together be 2.5 ohms. So here's 2.5 ohms compared to 1000 ohms. So here's our shortest path to ground. So the myth is that the electricity will take this shortest path to ground, protecting us. Let's see if that's true. Well, we have 2.5 ohms in parallel with 1000 ohms. That's just under 2.5 ohms together. So we have 2.5 ohms in series with 1 ohm, powered by 110 volts we're still going to get almost 80 volts across this part of the circuit. So we're still going to have 80 volts across our 1000 ohms here, which means we're still going to get about 80 milliamps, and we're still flirting with death. So this ground may only have 5 ohms of resistance, and it may have much less resistance than we do, but we can still get enough voltage across it to get enough current through us to be dangerous. Finally, here are the symbols that represent ground in a schematic diagram. This is a common connection. It is just a point in your stack of batteries or power supplies that we have designated as ground and is appropriate for our circuit. This is a chassis ground. That means our ground is also connected to a metal frame or box that our circuit is built in or on. And this is a true earth ground, which means we have a good solid connection to the earth. Unfortunately, many people improperly use this symbol as a generic ground which could represent any of the three, so we can't rely on this absolutely meaning a true earth ground. Also, there's no standard way to tell us that we have a true earth ground that is also a chassis ground, so you have to be familiar with the circuit you're working with. If you found this video useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel. And subscribe because that not only informs you when I put new videos up, but it really helps the channel also. And a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. I could not make these videos without your support. If you want to help me put these videos online and keep real vocational education free at vocademy.net, you can go to Patreon slash join slash vocademy and pledge your support. And again, a big thank you to my patrons who make this possible. And a big thank you to everyone for watching.